Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to talk about paint consistency or what the heck is the difference between a layer, a glaze, and a filter. We're going to stick to one color for that from one paint range but these lessons apply to just about anything. So today I'm going to be using this Indian Shadow from Scale 75. Scale 75 is uh, one of the paint ranges out there that has a much higher pigment density allowing you to take it down and make it thinner without it, well I often call it euphemistically snapping. But if you've ever thinned to paint a whole bunch and then put it on a model and had a bunch of tide marks or what's commonly called coffee staining occur, that's generally because the medium to pigment ratio was such that the pigment could no longer be evenly distributed amongst the thinned paint and the medium was no longer able to form the requisite bonds and distribute pigment evenly and so the pigment just clumped amongst where there were bonds that could be formed. That's how you get coffee staining. So, uh, but to understand how we avoid that and how we think about types of paint thinness, we need to start by uh, actually thinning some paint. So here on my palette, I have that aforementioned Indian shadow. Now, right as it is, I just squeezed that straight from the uh, dropper bottle onto the palette. And the first thing I wanna say is we talk about these things as though there are three distinct categories. We'll say this is a layer, this is a glaze, this is a filter or something like that. But really these are a spectrum. So the easier way to think about this is not as uh, there is some magic golden recipe, which is the next question that always comes up. Uh, what, how much do I thin? What's the recipe? How many drops of this to drops of that? And the answer is there is no answer. I'm sorry to tell you that there's just no recipe for this. Okay. Uh, this isn't baking, it's cooking. Uh, baking is science. You need exact parts of everything to actually make a cake rise to make the appropriate chemical reactions happen that give you cake or muffins or whatever. Cooking is a lot different. Uh, it's often you taste it, it needs a little more of this, a little more of that, and in the end it often comes down a lot to taste. But there is a spectrum to this rather than a distinct ratio, and different lines of paints, different uh, uh, mediums might affect it differently. So if you're using Chimera pure pigment colors, you're gonna find a, a much different ratio to get it down into a glaze. Same with something like Scale or Proacryl compared to say uh, Games Workshop paints or maybe like a pre-thinned air paint, which has already got a bunch of thinner in it. Hence what's making it flow through the airbrush. So let's get into the magic here. I'm gonna scoot that to the side for just a moment. And we're gonna bring in a little piece of paper that explains my spectrum concept. So we're gonna to have to zoom out a little. Did not realize how, how awful that was. There we go. So if you think about the full spectrum, layer is in fact much bigger than a glaze or a filter. These are both thin paints, but layer actually covers quite a bit. So I can just go straight into the paint, which has no water in it, other than what I, what's it, what it's absorbed from the wet palette or whatever, or taken straight out of the pot. And that's a layer, okay? And we all recognize that consistency uh, applied down. It's going to look pretty much, you know, will often be fairly opaque. It will often apply the color in a fairly true fashion. However, I might take a little bit of water, as we often see in our in our videos, if we're fans of Duncan or somebody like that, where we've heard two thin coats. And I could do the same thing here. Now, of course, this is going to be a little bit, uh, it'll dry out rather quickly because I'm just going over normal paper. But there it's thinned down, but I still have much the same effect. But you can tell, especially as it dries, that the color is a little different and it's not going to be quite as true. I could keep adding water to my mixture. So all I'm doing is putting the tip of the paintbrush in the water and thinning it out. And I'll still get something that's basically a layer. Okay. 
all of those would probably be called layer paints. You should notice there's quite a difference in how much they're actually covering, okay? Uh, we, in fact, we could probably even go a little bit thinner, but you can see now on my palette how they look. This is the original, this is the thinner stuff, but you'll notice it's still pretty much looking like that paint, right? And so I can keep going, stretching it just ever so slightly and still get something that's like a layer. And realistically, I could build from here to here to here to here just by establishing more thin layers of the paint. When we're going to go to a glaze, and I have a whole video on how to glaze, which I'll link down in the description. When we're going to go to a glaze, there we're thinning it much more. And it has to do with the purpose of the paint. It's as much about purpose as it is about effect. When I'm dealing with a layer paint, okay, what I'm ostensibly trying to do is paint this color onto, my finger's wet there, paint this color onto the miniature. I know that sounds weird. You might be asking yourself, well, what else would you be doing with the paint? And the answer is, well, lots of different things. With a glaze, I'm probably just trying to have a minor effect on the color to turn it lightly into this color. For example, I might be trying to create a shadow on something right? And hence, I want to still preserve the original color. For example, I have a nice blue cloak. I want to give it a nice dark shadow. Uh, so I'm, so I grab like a, a deep purple or a deeper version of the blue, or I mix in a little bit of black with it and I glaze it in. My goal is not to turn the cape that color. It's to uh, have that color interact with the original and create a shadowed version of the blue. So I'm not trying to turn it that color. And this comes in a lot when you get to things like skin. Glazing is how we both create our final blends often, because again, we're not trying to obscure or repaint the color. We're trying to bring maybe two distinct blends together, or we're trying to add a little ruddiness to the cheeks or something like that. But you can see how much more of the paper shows here when I'm going to a glaze. The other thing you'll notice about the glaze is you'll notice when I put these layers on, I hadn't wicked my brush at all, and yet I didn't get any paint buildup at the bottom. However, when I'm dealing with a glaze and the extreme thinness of it, if you want to avoid this drop at the bottom syndrome, you really have to be wicking your brush off first. So, and if you watch my how to glaze video, you'll see what I mean by this, but we keep a little paper towel here. I go into my glaze. I wick off all that excess fluid. It's just water waiting to cause a problem. And then I go ahead and glaze. And you notice I still deposit a little bit more down at the bottom, which is why it's so important when you have a glaze to always make sure you're glazing in the direction and leaving the brush, picking up the brush where you want to deposit the most paint. But nonetheless, that's a glaze. And then finally, and most rarely seen probably, but one of the most useful things you can, you can do is you can go to a filter. Now a filter is, honestly, not every paint is gonna do filters well. They have to be quite pigment rich. Things like inks make great filters, but this is enough, we can do it. Here we're taking a very small amount of paint and we're gonna really water this down. Okay. Notice how even much thinner than the glaze that is. I mean, that is basically water with a hint of color in it, right? It almost acts like a watercolor paint if you've ever painted like that. Even more important than a glaze with a filter is wicking off all that excess liquid. And you can see the difference there of just how much spills out of that, right? And then when we bring back up our sheet and we come to our filter section here, 
you notice that there is barely any color there. Okay. That's the consistency of a filter. Now, if I go a couple layers strong on it, I can build it up. It can start having some actual effect. But a filter is most often used for those very, very subtle effects. The light touch of maybe an OSL glow. Uh, the slight rosiness uh, of cheeks, right? Or something like that, where you want just the hint of that color in there. Okay? That's where your filters work. Uh, something like doing stubble, very, very light stubble on a chin is great as a filter. So you can see that, again, with each of these, I mixed them from the same paint and just added more water. The more water you're adding, the more important that that wicking of the paint becomes. But the important part I want you to recognize is this is all a spectrum. I didn't do anything magical with the paint. I didn't mix anything into it except the water out of a, a clean paint cup. There was nothing else going on there, okay? This, the first one, the layer, you notice how it's still basically holding its shape as paint, right? Like when you look at it on the palette, it still just looks like thinned paint. The glaze has largely broken up because the mixture here, it, you'll see this effect happen on the wet palette where it'll start falling into these like little clumps uh, because of the covalent bonds, right? Uh, being kind of dispersed in the water enough. The filter is gonna get real, real, real thin because it's mostly water. So what you'll see is it mostly hang together like water. What we're effectively doing here is transitioning more and more solvent into the paint. In acrylic paint, your solvent is water, okay? So you have three basic components to acrylic paint. Pigment, which is the pigment, the color, uh, binder, a binding agent, which in this case is acrylic medium and solvent. And all we're doing is adding more and more solvent. You can also do this with the addition of medium. So if you have thinner medium or glaze medium or master medium or contrast medium or lamia medium or any medium you like, it doesn't matter if it has the word medium in it, it's just fine. It'll work for this purpose. It doesn't matter any brand, any kind, it all works fine. Uh, but you don't need to. You can do this with water, especially if you have a higher quality, higher pigmented paint, okay? So now let's put this into action. We saw it on a piece of paper. Now let's put it into action on our friend, Larry the Ogre. He's got a fresh new coat of paint. Look at him, he's all ready to go. Uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna work some of this in. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna grab some of our layer paint. And this is where we're, uh, again, we've just added some water into it, but it's still basically paint, okay? And so here in the deepest shadow, say like this big thin crease on his back, we're gonna put that in there. Bottom of these muscle structures, right? That's a layer. You can see how it is basically turned the skin that color, okay? Easy enough. We all know layering. We've all done it a whole bunch. It's basically just applying paint. When we need to then smooth the transition between the two or add a little bit of that color, that's where we can go to our glaze. So our glaze can always test on the back of our hand. Need a little more paint. We over thinned that just a tad. And that's just it. That's why there's no ratio. And that's why you'll see me test on the back of my hand all the time, because every time you mix it, it's gonna be different. So with the glaze, we wick off all the excess, and then we're just gonna come in and bring that over and just glaze down. Maybe we'll get some of those upper muscle structures, some of these deeper recesses. But the goal here is to mostly still leave the skin color being dominant. Okay. Finally, the filter, the last one, you're gonna see how that has the most minimal effect. And in that case, we're still gonna mostly leave the skin intact. 
And again, all of this is a spectrum. I could mix a slightly thicker glaze. I could mix a slightly thinner layer, right? All of that would be fine. These don't have some kind of like exact definition of once you cross this particular point of opacity, you've left behind a glaze and you've entered into, uh, you know, into a, a filter or something like that. I wish there was some kind of scientific uh, thing I could point you toward that said that, but there just isn't. And when you get down onto things like the face, that's where you're really going to want to focus on that glaze and filter consistency. For example, I want to add some ruddiness to his big fat cheeks. This is where I'm working in a nice glaze consistency here. Maybe the bottoms of these little bumps he has on his head. Ogres have very expressive faces. But you can see how we can just work that in real subtly. Ironically, we're all much more familiar with this stuff than we think, mainly because uh, a, say, like a GW shade, like an Agrax or a Seraphim Sepia, is basically thinned to a sort of thin glaze consistency right away. That's what it's doing. It's just meant to gather up into the recesses and, and act a little thicker there than it would otherwise. But of course, if you apply it thinly, uh, if you take it and instead of, you know, sort of slopping it on like we tend to do with the washes, uh, what you'll actually get is something that looks like a, a glaze or even a filter. But you can see then how those different effects can mix together. You see how he has that nice dark red under his cheekies now. His little puffy red cheeks, his little puffy red jowls as he's yelling there. And you can see how those smooth out and we don't have the hard transition line once they're dry in between the deeper red and the skin. So, to summarize, okay? Again, layers represent a larger spectrum of how you're gonna use your paint. Glazes represent this thin area where, uh, where you can still see the color. It's still gonna be present it's going to interact a lot with the undershade. Filters are when you're just trying to add a tint to the undershade, but still let the undershade win. And that's what I mean when I say it's more about the effect than it is about the exact ratios. What paint is winning? Is what's underneath the paint you're applying right now winning, or is the paint you're putting down winning? If you're doing a layer, then the paint you're putting down is winning. If you're doing a glaze, maybe it's a little bit tied. If you're doing a filter, it's the color underneath. Okay? You're just trying to see it through a lens. Like as though you put on, you know, some, maybe a little bit of colored sunglasses or something like that. That's probably even too strong, but you get the idea. So, again, all of that can be mixed just with water. All right? Uh, the key is to always be testing your ratios first, just like I did here. First time I remixed a larger bat batch of that glaze, I was a little too weak. So I added a little more paint and I came up to here. So always be testing ABTs. And there's Larry. He's back. He's excited about his new red tones. Uh, he'll continue to star in future videos. Don't worry. Larry will always be with us. But uh, at any rate, there you go. That's paint consistency. I do hope that helped explain the whole concept. I know this is often very tricky stuff, especially for newer people to the hobby. So I hope this is absolutely helpful. Uh, if it is, give it a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating. We have new videos here every Saturday. Uh, if you've got questions, feel free to drop those down in the comments. Always happy to see those. Uh, if you've got suggestions for future topics, go ahead and drop those down there as well. But as always, I appreciate you watching this one, and we'll see you next one. Ah! Thank you.